dangerous ingredient is called azodicarbonamide. It's the same stuff they use to make yoga mats in the bottom of your shoes. It's toxic and it's flammable. Does that sound like eating fresh? To a dough conditioner called azido, az, azodicarbonamide. Azodicarbonamide. This is an ingredient that is also found in yoga mats and shoe soles to add elastic ingredient, ingredient that is also is called found azodicarbonamide. in yoga mats and it's shoe the same soles stuff they to use add to make yoga mats in I'm the bottom of your shoes. So what's the deal with this compound here? Now you'll be saying, he, seeing, uh, well, hearing that I'm actually saying compound here and not saying their name, and that's because that's one thing I want to get out of the way. Now, um, there's a lot of stuff I can say about the food babe, but, and I would make a series of uh, rants about her debunking all the BS science she puts out, but luckily I don't have to do that because Miles Power, this guy, um, he's a British organic chemist, he makes videos debunking this kind of junk, uh, he already has a series about her, so I don't need to, but just as he out artfully outlined this out, um, this is not that hard to pronounce, you just have to know each part of it. Azo, as in the freaking Azo group, Di, as in two, Carbon, as in the element carbon, and um, Amide, as in two Amide groups. There you go, that's how you pronounce it. Azo, Dicarbon, Amide. Simple. But, um, yeah, so what's the issue with this thing? Well, uh, so we used to put this in their bread. Well, actually, a lot of, um, like, fast food used to put it in their bread as a dough conditioner. It makes the dough, like, behave better when you cook it into bread or something. I don't know. I just want to make it because it's funny and everyone gets mad at it. But, um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's why it's yellow. I selected this stupid carbon. Uh, how do I unselect stuff in here? Uh, this is ChemDraw 3D. I don't know how to unselect stuff. <laughs> I never use the software. I just use normal ChemDraw, but I, I use it because it makes this cool spinning animation, which I couldn't figure out how to do with JSMOL. But um, yeah, so uh, this compound is controversial, as with every single chemical added to food, which I think is kind of silly because not all chemicals are bad. Everything is a chemical. It just depends on the amount, of course, and um, the properties of it itself. Just because it's used in plastic does not mean it is plastic. It is not plastic at all. It simply decomposes into nitrogen gas, carbon dioxide, and ammonia upon heating, and also nitrogen and carbon mon monoxide, but not as relevant. So that's why it's used in plastic. It's used to make foams, uh, usually polyurethane foams, such as yoga mats, of course, and uh, shoes, or well, the soles of them. And um, likely... Um, these slippers I have as well, these are polyurethane, they're cheap Chinese ones. So these are probably made with azodicarbonate amide as well. So yeah, you can see how this decomposes is, well, it has an azo group, it's quite unstable. Um, azo groups are quite strained usually, so they just go pop, and the whole molecule splits. Uh, not as bad as a peroxide group though. So that's basically how this molecule works. Now let's figure out how to make this stuff. Now. You can see these amides here. That kind of resembles something that I have in the lab, urea. So the plan is to take urea and then react with hydrazine to form a nitrogen-nitrogen bond here and then oxidize it to get rid of the hydrogens and that'll leave us with an azo group. Uh, I did not come up with this, of course. I stole it, but uh, aka I read Wikipedia. But yeah. Um, long time true uh, channel, <laughs> I cannot talk today, uh, long time viewers of this channel will know that um, I wanted to make this molecule, but I could figure out how. But now, I know a lot more about chemistry, so I can. And um, also, funnily enough, there is actually a recent paper about synthesizing this exact molecule. Now, so, yeah, that, that's basically it. Let's actually get into the video and stop rambling now. But there's the interesting chemistry part. There's some basic chemistry. And um, I'm also going to drop some reaction mechanisms for these, of course. Uh, let's go to the video and um, actually start running the reactions, I guess. So, step one, biurea synthesis. Condensing two urea molecules into one biurea with the help of hydrazine to form that nitrogen bond. 
So this is scaled up from paper. I'll put the paper down in the description. Here are the amounts of reagents I use for this first start uh, step, which is making biurea. So I'm just going to throw everything into a 500 milliliter flask and add around 200 milliliters of water to dissolve it all. Um, theoretically, I should actually use a liter of water, but um, I don't want to do that. Anyways, so here's that reflux, and I'm going to reflux it for seven hours. Around the halfway mark, I'm going to acidify it with some sulfuric acid back to pH 2 or so. So, yeah, as you can guess, this is a lot of waiting for this, but it's organic chemistry, so you can just leave it there sitting, and you don't even have to look at it. But, um, yeah, still very, very slow. <laughs> I think that's by urea. Uh, one more hour, and it's even wider now, so I'll just keep letting this go, I guess. I got this for another hour, so, um, yeah, uh, you can see some interesting effect here. This flask was clean. The liquid ran down smoothly, but now it's oily up. Okay, I'm blind. I didn't see it. It says uh, you add sulfuric acid after two hours and reflux it for a total of five. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So, I turn off... Okay, heat. Is it? No, it's not turned off. Uh, now it is. So, we'll remove the condenser. And let's do a pH test. It says maintain it between 2 and 2.5. So, there's some of that. That is highly basic, and, um... Oh, that is a smell. Uh, I think that's ammonia, but... Add some sulfuric in. It's been approximately one more hour, so... I'll just turn off heating now. I got it cooled down in a nice bath. So we're gonna let this cool down completely and filter it off. Okay, so there is our filter. A bit much, so I'll just put in the speaker and continue filtering. I'll just wash it. Okay, so yeah, break up this a bit. So here's our final product. And I'm just gonna let that dry out really quick and we should be good. There it is. Nice free flowing dry powder. So let's see how much we got from this, I guess. Oh, I'm gonna pick this up. Oh, don't wanna do that. We have... Oh, there's still a bit on there. Okay, so 34.93 grams. We should have gotten 53.1 grams, uh, assuming 0 0.9 mole urea, which is it should be so you have 66 percent yield not the best but eh, it, it works so it works i probably could just reflux it for longer i think that's the issue but i have no idea the lower you could also be due to the ammonium boiling off because i didn't add in the amount of sulfuric acid i don't know how this reaction works and uh, it could also be hydrazine decomposition which is probably more likely because i just used tap water for this reaction okay now let's do the oxidation of the biurea so um this paper uses uh, hydrogen peroxide with a catalyst of bromide, but uh, I don't actually have any potassium bromide. I do have hydrobromic acid, but um, that stuff's a bit precious. What I do have, however, is uh, an ampule of bromine that's kind of trash. Look at the quality of that. It sticks to glass. It's not very good. Here are the back of the napkin, literally, calculations I did for this. So this is scaled up from the paper again by, uh, I don't know, five? I think it's five. Yeah, five times larger so 11.5 grams which is 0.1 mole of biurea 0.36 grams of potassium bromide as the catalyst which is three millimole but uh, i didn't have that so i used 0.24 grams of elemental bromine and 46 milliliters of 30 percent hydrogen peroxide which is 0.45 moles of hydrogen peroxide as the oxidizer so let's put all that in the water perfect Triangle, uh, not triangle file, uh, metal file, and then you can just give it a good laceration like that. Look at that, scratch. Uh, you can also use a piece of quartz or a glass cutter. I don't have either of those. Well, I have quartz, but I don't know where it is. And uh, I cannot find my plier, so I'll be using this uh, wrench that is older than me. Perfect. Look at that, nice, clean break. So, what is it again? We need... 0.24 grams of bromine. Let's measure that out. 
Oh, that's a bit much, 0 0.55, eh, whatever. And the rest will go in this bottle. This bottle, uh, it does not have the best bromine in it either. Bromine. Um, because it's this doing the oxidation itself. The bromine pulls the hydrogen off of the um, uh, biurea to form HBr. You can see the bromine's dissolving in now. And um, that reaction is what actually uh, oxidizes the biurea. But then the bromine hydrogen bromide, of course, gets regenerated by um, the hydrogen peroxide to form out our um, uh, bromine again. So this technically is a catalytic cycle. It's just the bromine's doing the actual oxidation itself, not the hydrogen peroxide. So that's a bit interesting. And um, yeah, I'll throw the reaction me mechanism up now in editing. Hopefully, I don't forget this. Measure at eye level. Temperature's at 61 Celsius. I'll add a bit in. It's cooling down 57 degrees, 56.9. You can see it's regaining some of that yellow color. That's bromine forming again. 56.8. 56.9. I think that's just a water bath heating it up now. 57. Yeah, no, not really exothermic cells. This oxidation is carried out between 60 and 65 Celsius for approximately three to four hours. Uh, the exact length of time doesn't really matter that much, as long as it's enough that all the peroxide's consumed. Go ahead and turn off heating now, and I'll just let that cool down to room temperature, I guess. I'll probably throw some ice. So now I got an ice bath, and it's cooling down, so I'm aiming for zero Celsius. And um, then we can vacuum filter it off, and you can see it's a nice yellow color, so I think it is working. Still dropping. So there we have it. Filter this off. Ice bath water. Why? Why? Why do I say ice bath? Whatever. Nice tan powder. We got it dry now in the heat lamp, so we we'll just wait for that to dry to a constant weight, and we'll be good. Okay, it's been a few days, so this is definitely dry, and. Yeah, I hurt my finger <laughs> while doing something else here on the bench vice. I was trying to press something in the arbor press. So, uh, anyways, against doctor's orders, I'm gonna continue doing stuff because I am bored out of my mind. So, this should be thoroughly dry now. Um, let's go ahead and weigh it before we actually mess around with it and tamper with our yield, so... Good old electric scale here. Oh. And I do not have a container for this, so I think I will simply weigh onto a piece of aluminum foil, which it should be fine. It shouldn't react with it or anything. Uh, let me get that foil. Let's just go off. Okay, tear, and let's get our azo dicarbon amide on here. Tripod. Looks like cheese powder. Uh, on camera it looks more tan, but in real life it looks like, you, you know like the macaroni and cheese, like, like the instant ones? It looks like that cheese powder, or the cheese powder from those. We got 10.8. Five grams. Uh, I'll calculate the yield and I'll throw the yield up on the screen right now. That's how much yield we have. Uh, depending on my reaction, amazing, wow, or miserable. So now let's go ahead and test this. So according to the Wikipedia, it should be it should decompose around 225 Celsius. So here I got my hot plate heated up to 200 Celsius. It's not a very accurate test, of course, but it's good enough for me. And also because I need to build that melting point machine, but um. Yeah, I can't do anything other than code right now, and I can't code because I don't have the right parts for this, so, uh, yeah. But anyways, we'll just take a tiny pinch of this and sprinkle on the hot plate there. You can see there's nothing. Uh, let's go ahead and increment the temperature up to 220. Of 
course, the hot plate temperature is going to be lower on the surface than inside, which is that's where the thermocouple measures. It measures the internal temperature. But I also reduce the fume hood airflow. Actually, I'll just turn it off entirely because this doesn't decompose to anything poisonous. So, oh, it's already at 225. Oh, well, we'll see if it decomposes. Hot plate surface, not surface, hot plate at 225. So it's not decomposing. So I think I'll just crank the temperature up a bit more. I'm too lazy to go ahead and do a proper melting point test with a uh, oil bath and um, capillary tube. So I'll set this to like 250 Celsius. And we'll see if it decomposes. Okay, that didn't work. So the hot plate's at 430 Celsius now. And you can see if we simply put a bit of this on here, it profusely fumes and disappears. So I think that's a good sign. And you can see it leaves behind basically no residue. So I think next I'm going to do a real proper analysis of this and stick it in the old tube furnace, which has just recently been finished fully, and see if we can decompose it, because I believe that uh, the white fuming you're seeing is actually partial decomposition or it's just simply evaporating. So if I stick in a tube furnace where there's no choice but to heat the gas as well, it should decompose it thoroughly and I should be able to uh, analyze the actual gas I get from this. It's very similar to how uh, organic analysis used to be done, where you just burn it and you pass the gases through uh, different wash bottles and weigh them and see how much stuff you collected. So that's basically what I'm going to try to do. Of course, I can't anal analyze some of the things, such as carbon monoxide. I'm not able to measure that because I don't have the thing to well, measure carbon monoxide. Um, by that, I mean no chemical method, of course. And... Um, uh, carbon dioxide could measure with potassium hydroxide solution, but I can't be bothered. So I'll simply be testing for ammonia, which is the easiest to test, of course. I will just stick wet pH paper into a tube furnace. Okay, I got a tube furnace set up. So I'll go ahead and put hmm, this chunk into the furnace. Got powder everywhere. Whatever. Uh, we're now about halfway in. You can see some smoke over here now. I can hear boiling. So I would say that means it is definitely decomposing. Let's put this pH paper in and you can see ammonia or at least some kind of basic gas. So there you go, we've made azo dicarbon amide. Quite nice. And of course, just to make sure this is ammonia, faint smell of ammonia, not very strong. Sounds like the decomposition is done. And I will simply remove both ends of this and the night, yeah, that's definitely ammonia smell. The nice thing about having a tube furnace is that you can just crank it up to full power and let air burn out any impurities you have in there. In this case, everything in there should be organic. So a uh, quick burnout should just get rid of all that. And then uh, for any residual metals, I'll just run some acid through there. And that should clean up. Of course, I can remove the tube. It's just a pain. And then I have to recoil the nichrome around it again. I don't want to do that. So, yeah. Okay, uh, I just took out the fume hood to be curious. And uh, that is a very, very strong smell. And it's weird as well. It has the ammonia pungency, but also the sort of acidity burn choking smell of carbon dioxide um uh i don't know about the carbon monoxide though it's odorless <laughs> and nitrogen of course is also odorless but that is definitely one heck of smell um we should try making bread with it and again just for funsies ph paper huh i guess that's because the carbon dioxide and uh, ammonia are reacting with any present moisture to form ammonium carbonate, which is not as basic. I'll go ahead and wet the pH paper though. Yeah, turns blue. Let's see if I can get some more of the gases flowing, I guess. Hmm, not really. Interesting. But yeah, that's it for this video. Um, I would make the bread in this video, but actually I would do that in a separate one because this one is way too long. Um, by that I mean my phone storage is full again. Um, everything is being recorded on a phone. I really need a real camera because it's so 
annoying to transfer files from my phone to my computer because this is an Apple phone and everything's proprietary. So, um, yeah, yeah, Dropbox, Google Drive, whatever. It takes forever to upload. And my computer's right here. Why do I have to upload it onto the internet before I can get it on here? Before you say, just plug the phone into the computer. I tried that. Guess what it does? It puts all of your stuff in chronological order, which um, is really annoying for me because that is not how I do things. Uh, is that thing melting? But yeah, um, it also doesn't show your uh, albums, so I'm not able to just select one video's footage and upload. I have to manually comb through all of every piece of like file garbage in the gallery app on my phone. So yeah, I should get a real camera, but ah, that's for the future. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And um, I was gonna do other oxidation methods of that, such as just using bleach, but yeah, uh, I'm lazy and this works fine. Uh, I don't know what to do with the biurea though. It's kind of useless as a chemical. So um, when I do make the bread video, I think I'll show off some other methods of oxidation, maybe electrochemical. That might be interesting. Uh, I do not know anything about electrochemistry, so <laughs> it's not going to work very well, probably. But I think it'll be worth showing. Um, there, I have not found a paper about the electrochemical oxidation of that, so yeah, I'm going to have to try this. But yeah, see you guys next video, I guess.